tonight's event is all about registered reading groups. And how many people are in a registered reading group at the store now? About half. Okay. So the way the way our re registered reading groups work is that um, you guys decide you're going to get your books from us, which we really appreciate. So you come to us with um, a list of your members and a contact person, and we put them in file. And then you order your books. You say, okay, we need um, five copies of Comet Seekers, and our discussion is July 3rd. So we get the five copies in, and we contact your group, lead, group leader or whoever's contact information you gave them. We hold the books at the front desk. And the big news is, is that we get a 20% discount on any book you've ordered for your registered reading group. It helps you get your books at a discount. It helps us because we're dealing with one person and it's a small quantity, but we can go to the publisher. And it just makes it easier all around. Um, and as a registered reading group, you got first dibs on a night like tonight. And we also do this wonderful thing. This new thing is wonderful. We um, invite your group to the store. And usually it's uh, Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, which is when we lock the doors. So basically the store is yours, and you have access to one of our booksellers. You give us some parameters of what you'd like, and we will book talk specifically to your group. So say you only do women writers who published before 1950. Well, we'll come up with a list, and we'll read them so we know what has something to talk about. And um, it's great fun for us. Some groups come, have their book talk, and go out to dinner. <laughs> Other groups come with their wine and cheese and just settle in for the evening or for a while. And either way, it's really fun. We also will sometimes attend your meetings off-site, but it's sort of special to have one of the store and you can prowl the shelves and talk about what you've read and what you haven't. So that's part of being a registered reading group. Um, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention for reading groups is the Indie Next list. There's one for reading groups. There's one. These are all my props. I never have props. Um, there's one that's put out every month. It's a great collection of books that are just published that month, both in paper and in hardcover, recommended by indie booksellers from all across the country. So that's one source of um, uh, choices for, for you to consider for your group. But then twice a year, the same organization, which is our wonderful um, trade organization, uh, independent booksellers, put together a, a list just for reading groups. And they usually are all paperback. And um, we have them in the window in that room. And uh, it's just a great resource. So that's it for explanation of what we're doing. Uh, tonight, we have the honor of having Ann Kingman from Random House and Anne DeCourcy from HarperCollins. I could have come up with reps with two different names, but they spell differently. They're spelled differently. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about meeting with reps. This afternoon, I met with Ann Kingman um, for half of the Random House titles. Now, Penguin Random House is now one company, and we actually have five reps because they have so many books. Ann's list is a mere 835 titles. And that's just for fall. We meet three times a year. Um, and so I go through the list before she comes, and then she sees my numbers and goes back and makes recommendations and answers the questions that I've had. And we talk about the big books, and the sales reps meetings are really important. And then tomorrow morning, I'll meet with Anna Corsi, and her Harper list is 100 books more than that, but it is all of the adult books and the kids' books. It's the whole line. But so we're, we're approaching huge amounts of books being published every year. And it's the help of these amazing women and their colleagues that we're able to curate the selection that you see when you come into our store. Um, sometimes they encourage us to take more. Like Ann told me today about a book that's already been booked for an interview on 60 Minutes and Fresh Air and somebody else, and I'd only order two. Well, that's obviously not enough. And sometimes they'll say, mm, not for you. And I really appreciate it when they say no, too. Just like we sometimes say to you, you're not going to like that one. <laughs> we do say that. And, and they do the same for us. And it's that relationship that, um, that happens in this wonderful publishing industry, book industry, that, that lets us be who we are.
So without further ado, oh, one other thing, the yellow list in your hand, separated by rep, alpha by title, we take A's and the's off the beginning of titles just to make it easy to find stuff so you can make notes as the books are being talked about. So who's going to go first? And of course, he's going to go first. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Anne with an A. <laughs> I like my A. Um, so I, I, what Anne and I are going to do are divide our books into groups of five and then pass the mic over so you don't get totally sleepy hearing to our dulcet tones. Um, so I'll, I'll do five and she'll do five and we'll go back and forth. Um, and I have just clumped mine in any old order and the first book I'll talk about is Sarah Perry's The Essex Serpent. Um, this is now in paperback. It was a huge bestseller for us in hardcover. It's set in the 19th century and Cora's husband, who wasn't a very pleasant man, has died. And she is now free to pursue the intellectual life that she had not been able to do while he was alive and has heard of in the country um, rumors of a massive serpent returning after 300 years of absence goes to the country to investigate this, puts on her naturalist hat, and there meets the vicar in the village who he too believes that this serpent has returned, but he thinks that this is reflecting moral turpitude and things like this. So there they are both kind of meeting and coming together over the Essex serpent and trying to figure out what it is, is it for real? the death of a young man, was it caused by the serpent or not? Um, Sarah Perry is just a very fine, fine writer. Her language in this is um, florid, which I think suits the, the subject. It's very kind of Victorian England. We're actually publishing a new book from her um, that I'll be talking to Liza about tomorrow called Melmoth, which is a contemporary novel set in Prague. Um, but. Number one, the cover is gorgeous on this, so I, it's one of my kind of picks of the list. Um, the next book is by Thridi Unregards, um, Everybody's Son. And uh, Thridi at one point was affiliated with the Boston Globe and did, I think, book reviews for the Globe. She now lives in Cleveland and has lived there for many years. Everybody's Son, um, Thridi Unregard. Um, and this is a story set in Boston, and it is a multiracial adoption story where young Anton has been removed from his family home when his mother has disappeared to a local crack house and left him in the stifling heat, unable to get out of his home. When he finally escapes, he's brought by DCF to a foster care situation. And it is the story of a Harvard-educated judge and his wife who are looking to raise another child. Their son has died in a tragic accident, so they are looking to have another family. And strings are pulled, and Anton becomes their son. And um, it's not a good, good fit. Things aren't smooth, and things are hidden from him that um, being an adoptive parent, you don't hide certain things from your kids, um, and they're hidden from him, and the repercussions are great. Th 3D Umregard did a book years ago that you may have read, um, The Space Between Us, The Weight of Heaven. Um, she's done a lot of books that are great for, for book clubs, so I recommend that. Um, the next I have is from an English author, Ruth Hogan. It's The Keepers of Lost Things. And this is one of my light, lovely books on the list. Number one, I, I chose pretty books this time, too, I think. Um, <laughs> but the, the Keeper of Lost Things is a story of a man whose uh, wife died, I can't remember, years ago. And so to kind of compensate for that loss, he has collected lost things things in his mansion and tries to reunite those lost things with their owners. He realizes that the end is near in his life and has given his mansion and this collection to his assistant to continue on with you know, the reuniting of lost things with people. Um, just a lovely story. Ruth Hogan I follow on Instagram. She's always posting pictures of 
things that she's found in the sidewalks in London. Um, it's really quite del delightful. Okay, this one, again, another book that I love the cover of, No One Is Coming to Say This, Stephanie Powell Watts. Now look closely at this cover. Does it, anybody recognize the art style? Oh, yes. <laughs> she doesn't count. It's, um, I, what I love is this is a cover artist. Um, the artist actually painted the portraits of the Obama, uh, Michelle Obama, right? Yeah. yeah, Michelle. So we have two books from her, um, or illustrated by her. But no one is coming to save us. Stephanie Powell Watts, um, African American writer, and this is a loose interpretation of The Great Gatsby set in North Carolina, where a wealthy, black man has returned to his village hoping to marry his childhood love, finding that she's married to someone else, and her husband has kind of lost his source of income and lost his verve, and so it's the stress between the haves and the have-nots, the wannabes, and those who have it but who maybe are not so happy. She is a really fine writer. We've also done a collection of short stories from her, which has been a, an award-winning short story collection, but um, I just I love the cover. So there. One of my favorite, favorite, favorite authors is Wiley Cash, and this is the last ballad from Wiley. Um, he is a complete delight. If you ever get a chance to meet him, if he's ever here for an event, we need to get him up here. Um, he will just charm you, I mean, and he is incredibly charming. This story is set in 1929, and it's a story of Ella Mae Wiggins. Ella Mae Wiggins was a mom of four or five kids, I can't remember the number, earning $9 a week at the local mills. Barely enough to pay for food to put on the table, not enough for shoes. And her life, her prospects are not good. She lives in a, she's a white woman living in a community of black people because that's the only place she could live at that time. If you associated with people of a different race or color, you were ostracized. And so her prospects were terrible. Nearby, there have been rabble rousers. The union has come into town. The union by the people in power is pegged as communist, so they're not well loved. But of course, it's a union that's there to bring fair wages, fair working wages. This is based on a true, little known story of Ella Mae Wiggins, who was um, a song songwriter herself. And she, in the story and in real life, did get involved with the unions and was the person who sang to the crowds and inspired them to um, get out there and do what they had to do to get their rights um, taken care of. Um, and some of her songs, and I thought this is fascinating, this is something we do when we sell to our buyers. We have to go online and mark up our catalogs online. And I included a link to the performance of an Ella Mae Wiggins song by Pete Seeger. Mm -hmm. So that was her stature at that time. Um, it is a brilliant story. It's a tragic story. It's a dual narrative, too. It's narrated by her daughter many years later. Um, talking about what happened, but also a very much you were there. I, I could not put this one down. I thought it was just a brilliant book. So um, Wiley Cash, The Last Ballad. That's my first five. First Thank you. Um, I want to give my colleague Anne credit for remembering all the characters' names. It's something I can never oh, do. The minute I finish a book, the characters' names just go out of my head. So fortunately, they're usually on the back. Yes. Um, I did not pick books for their pretty covers, but um, <laughs> there are some interesting themes that have just by accident arisen. Um, but my first book that I want to talk about is There Your Heart Lies by Mary Gordon. Um, Mary has been an esteemed writer for decades. Um, she's one of what we call a writer's writer. Um, people that other writers really look to. Um, sometimes that means that they don't sell particularly well, but in Mary's case, she's got a, a ton of acclaim and sales, so that's nice. Um, this is set in 1936 and, and 1937, where it starts, and also in modern day. And it's a story of Marion who grows up in an Irish Catholic family, and her father does something really terrible that she disagrees with. And so even though she's very well to do and comes from a very stable family, she decides to marry her brother's lover and go on a ship to help the Spanish Civil War. She's going to help them with, with medical um, 
medical needs. And so she goes to Spain, and it's partly that experience, and it's the experience of her telling these stories to her granddaughter in her cottage in Rhode Island, where Marion is 92, and her granddaughter is in her 20s and really trying to find herself. And so in the process of helping her granddaughter try to find herself, she tells the story of these experiences that she had in Spain and how these family secrets that were long long held um, inspired her to go do these really brave and, and unusual things. Um, it's wonderful. I didn't know much about the Spanish Civil War at all. I love learning history from fiction. I think it's a great way to kind of get the personal behind it, and this does an amazing job of that. So I am Irish Catholic. I have nothing against Irish Catholics. But this is also a book about um, an Irish Catholic dysfunctional family. Um, it's the story of uh, Nora and Teresa Flynn, who come to the United States from Ireland in the 1950s. And Nora is the responsible older sister. Um, she's, I think, 21 when she comes over. And she does all the right things. She finds employment. She does everything she needs to do to take care of herself and her sister. And Teresa is a little flightier, a little younger, and a little more adventurous. They um, are very different, and they have very different lives. And Teresa makes a decision that impacts them both. This is also set back in, in the 1950s. You learn the story of Nora and Teresa, and you see where they are today, and how, again, family secrets come into play. I think they probably do in all families, but in, in this particular case, um, it's a really interesting place because Nora has raised four children, and Teresa is a nun in a convent. And after years of being estranged, they come together, and you find out what these secrets are. You may know Courtney Sullivan from Maine, which is probably her best known. She does family secrets really, really well. <laughs> I know many of you are fans of Anita Shreve. Um, this was her last book. Sadly, Anita Shreve died this past fall. Um, and it was doubly sad because she was supposed to go on book tour for this book, and I was hoping to actually meet her, um, but she had to cancel because she was ill. Um, but I loved this book. It was the first Anita Shreve book I had ever read. Um, and it's based on a real story. In Maine, in 1947, there were um, 100,000 acres along the coast that burned in a forest fire. It was absolutely terrible. Um, so this novel is set there and then. Um, Grace Holland is a young mother, and she is someone who has somewhat of an unhappy marriage. And she lives in this little cottage kind of near the beach. She's a housewife. She's never really done much with her life besides raise her family. And this fire breaks out. And all the men from the town go to help fight this fire to stop it from encroaching on the, on the village. And Grace and her neighbor have to save the children. So they go to the shore, and they get into the water, and they stay in the water for hours as this fire rages beyond them. When everything is done, they come out, and Grace's husband is missing. And she has nothing. She has no home. She has no job. She has no way to make a living at all, and she's forced to fend for herself. And then, of course, there's a twist, but I won't spoil that for you. Um, but it, again, a really wonderful book that's set based on a, a small incident. I mean, it was a large incident at the time, but a small incident in history that many people didn't know anything about. Um, but it, it's, there's a lot to talk about. I think this is a really excellent book group book for people who like to get into real <coughs> motives and, and should the character have done that and should the character have done this, um, those kinds of discussions. So this is the hardcover. The paperback is coming out in July. It's called Stay With Me. Um, the jacket will look quite different, so I'm sure Liza and Penny and the staff here can help you find it when it comes if you don't recognize it right away. Um, this was my favorite novel of last year, and it's set in contemporary Nigeria, and it's the story of, let me look at the characters' names, <laughs> Yajidi and Aiken. And they are a couple um, in Nigeria. They've been together since college, and they decide to get married. And in Nigeria, uh, polygamy is still very much an accepted practice. But they decide that they're going to remain monogamous and have a monogamous marriage and be true only to each other. And that sounds wonderful until four years into the marriage and they still have not conceived a child. And the husband's mother and, and family basically um, almost bully him into taking a second wife who then moves into their home. And so it's a story of what happens 
the different dynamics of all these characters. It's wonderful. Um, there's a lot about l little glimpses of Nigeria. It, it's not a travelogue by any means. You don't necessarily get a full picture of what it's like to live there. But there's just enough detail of the various cultural differences that I found it really fascinating as well. It was like almost a separate character in itself. And then my last book for this set, Homegoing, by Yaa Jesse. Um, and this was my favorite novel of the year before. <laughs> you may find some similarities. Um, has anybody read this? It's been, oh, excellent. A lot of you, good. I, I've been evangelizing this book for a couple of years now. And it, it's starting to feel like a book club classic, You know, one of those that lots and lots of book clubs have read. Um, it's, it covers centuries of Ghanaian history, of, of, of history of, of a family. Um, we start in Ghana in the 1700s. There are two babies born. They're half-sisters that are born in separate villages. Uh, one, Effia, <laughs> um, marries, is married off to an Englishman <coughs> who's actually part of the slave trade. And the other sister, Essie, is actually taken as a slave and enslaved in the, um, in the basement of the castle where Effia lives above. And these two sisters have extremely divergent lives. And it follows, the book follows chapter by chapter the descendants of each of these two women until you get to modern day. So we follow Effia's descendants and we follow Essie's and we see how their lives have been so completely different one of whom is married to a slave trader and one of whom is a slave. And then we see how also they are, in some ways, in many ways, very much alike. Stunning, stunning book. And it's all sold. I want that one. Okay. <laughs> Here you go. No, it's okay. Oh, you want I'll the take mic. the mic. You know, sorry. <laughs> now, that, that book's been on my list for a while. I, we don't get to read other publishers' books all that often because there's just so much on our own list. You know, I'm always envious. <laughs> Um, when people have read my books. Um, so I have one nonfiction book on my list. It's Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Bill Gates said, I would recommend this book to anyone interested in a fun, engaging look at early human history. You'll have a hard time putting it down. This covers several hundred thousand years of human history, how we went from, I, I'm not a scientist, six human species down to the one that we have today. Looking at different disciplines, um, agriculture, economics, uh, biology, anthropology, everything. This um, is finally in paperback. We had the hardcover out for quite a number of years um, because it was selling so well we didn't need to put it in paper. I, I can't hold it open, but um, there, there's illustrations throughout, there are maps. Um, this is just a, if you want something that's nonfiction and really dense and want to drink a lot of wine, this would be a very <laughs> good book to have for your book club. Um, that's Sapiens. On to something quite different. She Rides Shotgun by Jordan Harper. Um, this is a debut novel from Jordan Harper. It is a thriller, um, and it opens with a literal bang in which a 11-year-old girl is kidnapped by her father, who has just been released from prison. And it's pretty dramatic. You don't know why this is happening. It's stressful, and you find out that her mother has just been killed by the mob who's after her. They're going to get her next. And so dad is protecting her. He's kidnapping her and on the run with her, keeping her away from these bad guys. And in the process, developing what he has never had with her, which is a full-fledged father-daughter relationship. And um, the stakes become that much higher for him to protect her. And she goes from being a teddy bear holding, kind of naive little 11-year-old who's very sweet and, and restrained to someone who can take down a grown man if need be. Um, <laughs> he's trained her well. So, you know, a light read. Um, Bryn Chancellor's Sycamore was just one of our favorite books in-house. Um, this is, I believe it's a debut. She's done short fiction before. Um, it's set in a town, a small town in Arizona, where many years prior, a young teenager went missing and has never been found. Very quickly in this book, um, I think it 
it's within like 50 pages, her remains are found. So it's not a mystery of who done it or why, but it's a mystery <coughs> being uncovered of how did the town respond? What were the repercussions to the people in that town of the disappearance and of the finding of this young woman? It is just, it's a beautiful portrait of, you know, different people's reactions and truths coming out that open up cans of worms and how you move on from that. Beautiful, beautiful book. I think um, just worthy of a read. Beatrice Williams, The Wicked City. This is a dual narrative. It's set in contemporary New York City where a woman has moved out from her husband who has a penchant from prostitutes and she's decided maybe not. <laughs> so she's moved into her a new kind of uh, condo, a loft in Soho. No, Grant, whatever, in Greenwich Village. Um, and is warned by this very attractive landlord who lives next to her that she should ignore the noises coming out of the basement every night. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the noises are clinking glasses and laughter and just animation. And it turns out that the building once harbored a speakeasy. And so the dual narrative is going back to the history of that speakeasy and a particular woman in that speakeasy who has connections to our wife in contemporary times. Really, it's Beatrice Williams. She's just a great, <laughs> great author. Two Steps Forward um, is from, okay, I'm not sure how to pronounce his first name, Graham Simpson and his wife, Anne, I can't, uh, Anne, um, <laughs> with an E. Um, and Graham Simpson wrote The Rosie Project. So this is his first book with HarperCollins, and it's a story of two people who independently, one because he's had a nasty divorce, the other because I believe her husband has died, decide to go on the, okay, I have to look at this one, the Camino de Santiago pilgrimage route. And it's the paths that these two people take and their meeting, and it's, I mean, it's lovely. Just lovely, the, the kind of mending of relationships. Two steps forward. That's it. Yep. <coughs> okay. I have sort of loosely grouped things. <laughs> um, th these are kind of award winners. So a lot of times you'll see all the buzz about awards and award winners, but you're never really sure if those books are for you. So I hope that I can take some of the more recent award nominees and give you a sense of that. Um, I'm going to start with Dark at the Crossing by Elliot Ackerman. And um, this is a book that was a National Book Award finalist last year. And it was a book that um, sometimes we in publishing underestimate what we have. <laughs> so it wasn't a book that, in fact, I might have even told Liza, no, you don't need this book. <laughs> and then it went on to be a best book of the year and was shortlisted for the National Book Award. And fortunately, Liza listens to me when I email her and say, oops, I messed up. Please bring this one into your store. <laughs> Um, but now it's in paperback. Um, and it's a story of um, Harris Abadi, who is an Iraqi who has um, spent much of the, the war being a translator for um, Americans in Iraq. And he becomes a US citizen as a result of his service. Um, but after giving some hard thought to the war and the morality behind the Iraq war, decides that he wants to go fight with the Syrian rebels against the Assad regime. So he goes to Turkey in an attempt to get across into Syria, where he's robbed of all his belongings. And he's taken in by a Syrian couple who change his life in, in a matter of days. Um, and it looks at you know the morality of war, also the uh, question of, of black and white. You know, are, are, is there a good side and a bad side in a war? Um, and who are the people that are really affected by the war? And they're not often, often the ones who are directing the war, but rather the people on the ground. Um, really strong writing. Um, uh, the author was a Marine uh, for many years and also an international journalist. So he knows the, the area that he writes about very, very well. Uh, and it's not the lightest book, but it's definitely worth reading. All right, I know a lot of you know Arundhati Roy from The God of Small Things. That book was written in 1999. 
This book was published last year, and it was her first novel since The God of Small Things. It's been almost 20 years. She really devoted her life to writing other things, to reporting and doing journalism. So when she finished this manuscript, it was a huge international publishing event. And it's a complicated story to tell. And I would warn you that if you are one of those readers who really likes a lot of plot and a lot of things to happen, that this might not be the book for you. But if you love amazing writing and de well-developed characters that are all very different from each other, this I can't think of a better book to fall into. Um, the main focus of the novel is on two separate characters. Um, one of them, Anjum, is a, I had to write this down because I always forget, a hijra, which um, in the Hindu tradition uh, is the word for intersex, people who are neither male nor female at birth. And the, one of the characters it falls into that. Um, there's an Indian proverb that says the only happy people in India are the hijra. So we learn a lot about her life. She be the character becomes outwardly female to, to live her life. Um, the second character comes a little bit later in the book, and um, it's a uh, person who fights for the Kashmiri freedom. And so a lot of this goes into the political realms of things that have happened throughout Indian history and Pakistani history. Um, but you get glimpses of it, but it's really about the characters, and it's really about the writing. Um, Arundhati Roy is, is one of the genius writers, I think, of our time, and she's um, just somebody who I'll, I'll read anything. Hopefully it won't be another 20 years before she has another novel. Um, she just has a wonderful way of kind of pulling you in, especially when you don't think you want to go there. She pulls you in and she holds you there. All right, another brilliant writer. This is my challenging list, this little section. Um, Allie Smith. I don't know if any of you have read Allie Smith, but her books are never about anything, but they're about so much, if that makes any sense. Um, and she is also, I think, one of our most brilliant writers, but also one of our most brilliant thinkers. Um, so Autumn, this is the first book in what will become a four-book cycle. So she's going to do one for each season. And they don't connect at all in terms of plot or characters. But when the four books are done, together as a whole, she promises they will be something. <laughs> so Autumn is in paperback now. Winter is coming out this fall. Um, but this has been um, lauded, well, it was a, a Booker Prize uh, nominee and was a New York Times 10 Best of the Year. But almost all of the reviews called this the first post-Brexit novel. Um, there's a lot in here about Brexit. It's not done in a, in a clunky way at all. It's, it's part of the story. The book's not really about Brexit, but it, it does um, have a place there. And it's one of those books where you read it and you put it down and you think, I'm not really sure what I read, but it was amazing. <laughs> and then there's lots to talk about. All right, David Grossman, who wrote one of my other favorite novels called To the End of the Land. Um, this is his most recent book, A Horse Walks Into a Bar. And I'm going to be honest, I hate, hate, hate the title of this book. I would call it something else. I don't know what. However, the book itself, um, I think the title works. It is set in a dive bar in Israel. And the main character, Dove, is turning 57. And he's a stand-up comic. And he decides to sort of have a show for the ages. He invites an old friend, someone he hasn't seen since he was nine years old, to come into the audience of this show. And this bar is, is crowded. People are expecting to see a stand-up comedian. Dove gets up on stage. And he immediately starts telling pretty bad jokes and almost starts bombing. And you kind of see him get more and more uncomfortable as you read. You see the audience. That's the amazing thing about this book. Is like you could, it feels like you're in the audience. You know, you're getting physically uncomfortable at this character who's not doing a very good job of stand-up comedy. And then Dove starts to make it personal. And he starts to tell his story somewhat through jokes. And some of the jokes are inappropriate and make people shocked make people some get up and leave. But through these jokes, he tells his history and his story and the story of his family and the story of terrible things that have happened in his life. 
and you know that this person that he's invited to be in the audience <coughs> who's sitting not too close but not too far, they make eye contact, but you're not really sure what their connection is, you then learn what this connection is and why he invited this person there. And it's a dark and it's a sad and it's not at all a comic, a comic book, even though the title, which is kind of why I think I have a problem with it, because it sounds like it's you know, going to be flippant. But it's a really serious book. It's, I, I was gutted when I finished this. I mean, I, I had to not read anything for about two days. Um, it's just one of those books that kind of grabbed me emotionally, which David Grossman tends to do. So that is uh, A Horse Walks Into a Bar. And then I don't know how brave some of you are. If you like speculative fiction, but American War is one of the strongest that I've read in a really long time. Um, it's set in 2074, and America has uh, split into two. We're basically in our second civil war. Um, climate change has become a thing. The coasts have shrunk because of flooding and global warming and all kinds of things. Basically, the whole East Coast and the West Coast have been wiped out. The government has relocated to, I believe, Ohio. Sorry? I just was thinking of Casey. Oh. <laughs> um, and the, it's sort of divided into north and south lines again. Um, and the north, which is where the government is, has banned fossil fuels. But the south, that's a little more rich in natural resources, does not want to give up its coal and its gasoline. And they don't want no part of this. And so they basically secede. And our main character, Surratt, Chestnut, and her family are kind of caught on the border. They live in sort of the purple zone. They're neither red nor blue. They're neither north nor south. And it's very difficult for anybody to make a living, especially Surratt's father. So Surratt and her family end up in a refugee camp. And Surratt is young. I think she's eight or nine. And her father has been killed. <coughs> and she and her family are in this refugee camp where they're not supposed to be really politically aligned in this camp. It's supposed to be pretty neutral. And then we see what happens to Surratt. And over the course of many years, she becomes radicalized. And she is forced to do things that perhaps we would question was that she should do or not. Um, the question of morality, again, becomes fuzzy. You know, the things that she does that are really terrible you almost, in a way, kind of root for her, even though she's making choices that none of us in this room would ever make. But you see how it happens because you're with this character for so long. Um, it's interspersed with, um, if I can show you, uh, newspaper articles that, and oral histories. So it feels almost like you're reading a history. It's really amazing. Um, this is American War by Omar El Akkad. Um, he is also a journalist. And he brings a journalistic style to this, which just really makes it come alive. And that's my five. So I'm not going to talk about one book just yet, because very similar. So we're going to get a little break <laughs> from that. Um, but I will talk about The Comet Seekers by Helen Sedgwick. Um, and uh, this, I have to look at the back of the book to get the names of the characters. And I'm going to maul the Irish name Roy Zinn, R O I S I N. Racine. Racine. There, there we go. Okay, <laughs> sounds better. And Francois, I got that one. Um, coming from Ireland and France, and have met in the Antarctic, um, where there is an expedition to view comets that are exploding over the Earth's surface. And she is there as an amateur scientist to observe and have this experience. He is there as the chef for the people at this um, event. The two of them forge a connection. And this connection is, and this is the weird part, but it, it goes back centuries. And it's informed by comets appearing over the Earth over the centuries. So there's a little bit of a. Um, kind of a magical element to it, but it, it goes back to medieval Europe, where they first had met um, with the comets happening, and back to contemporary times. Um, it's, it's just a beautifully written book. I think it's a little bit of a challenge. You have to go with the magical realism, um, but I like that kind of thing, so comet seekers. Um, 
This is Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows. It's by Bali Kaur Jaswal, um, a British, well, actually, she studied in the UK, but she now lives in Singapore. Um, this was um, a Reese Witherspoon first book club pick, which kind of shocked us. None of us knew this was coming, and <laughs> there it was on her book club list. And it's a story of a family in London. Dad has died, and they, the family is destitute. Um, and the eldest daughter in this has tried to distance herself from the, the traditional background of her Indian family um, and has decided to make money to help the family and is going to teach a course at a local university. And she gets there and is all ready to teach and the Indian women who show up there think this is English as a second language course but she's teaching a course in creative writing <laughs> and they decide to go with it and she pulls out stories from these these women who she realizes underneath all the exterior um, clothing and everything, the, the culture that they live with, that these are women who are living, feeling creatures, human beings who have erotic stories to tell. And so she brings out these erotic stories from these, these Punjabi widows. The only problem is this class becomes extremely popular, so more and more women are signing up for it. The stories are pretty raunchy. Um, and there's a group of men out there who are trying to keep these women confined and chaste and and good, good Punjabi widows, um, but they keep writing their stories. So a, a fun book. Um, okay, I'll go on to my um, alternative future history book, The Book of Joan by Lydia Yuknovich. I am fascinated with this author. Um, she did a TED talk about writing and coming from nowhere and becoming, you know, a New York Times reviewed author. This is a woman who wears, um, I would say, Ukrainian clothing and has a big braid wrapped around her head and wears hiking boots with this. She's just really different, really unique. And her books are really disturbing and really challenging. Um, I, I read The Small Backs of Children, which I'm not talking about tonight because it was just, that was a hard book to read. The Book of Joan is a future dystopian novel. Um, the world has been decimated. The ground we stand on is radioactive. And humans now have to live in these floating platforms above the Earth. Those who remain on the Earth are um, they're, they're kind of a gender neutral, hairless, mut mutant human um, race that's out there. There is a leader of these, these people, Jean de Men, who is a charismatic and bloodthirsty cult leader who turns everything to, he is just gaining power. And then a radical group trying to bring him down and get life kind of free again. And that radical group is inspired by a young Joan, modeled after Joan of Arc. Um, and so this is a retelling of the Joan of Arc story, but set in the future with um, really weird, hairless <laughs> human beings. <laughs> All right, I only have two more books, and one you probably have already read, but Anne Patchett Bel Canto. If you haven't read it, do. There is a movie coming this fall. Um, and I have a bootleg. Well, not a bootleg, but I have a copy of it. <laughs> they sent it to me last week, so I get to watch the movie before anybody else. I'm really excited. Um, it's starring Julianne Moore and Eric, Eric Watanabe. Um, if you have not read this book, this is, this is maybe my top pick on the list. Um, I listened to it a number of years ago and just fell in love. Uh, it's set in South America. <clears throat> it's a birthday party at the embassy for a Japanese businessman whom they're trying to woo to bring his business to the South American country. And an opera singer has been brought in. He loves this opera singer. She performs, and then the doors are burst down, and a tribe of radical people are coming in to take over the embassy. Oh, the relationships that form. If you haven't read it, it's, it's brilliant. Um, I have one more book, and then I'm going to mention one more book, because I'm going to sell it to Liza tomorrow, and you all have to go line up and pre-order it. Um, but this is my one 
YA, meaning young adult book on the list, The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Um, for It's a hardcover, and it will be a hardcover until next year, but uh, lest you're worried about the price, I think it's like, I don't see it on here, $18.99. So it's the same price as a adult paperback. The Hate You Give um, is a debut from Angie Thomas, who lives in Alabama. Alabama, I think, I'd have to look that up, um, was as a teenager a rap star, um, doesn't do it now, but instead wrote this novel. Um, this is the book that when I read it in manuscript form, um, I'm getting all <laughs> emotional about it. Um, it was, it just made me feel so white, you know, like I don't know anything and you don't you read this book and you learn something about being black you learn that if the police stop you in your car you don't you know reach over and get your license or stuff you put your hands on the dashboard you don't turn off the you turn down the radio you just don't do anything this book opens with a girl coming home from a party with her best friend Police stop the car, black girl, black driver. Police stop the car and they shoot him dead in front of her. And this is the repercussions for her, for the community, for the blacks, the whites, for everybody. This is a highly educated girl who is growing up in basically a ghetto where the color of your skin is a death sentence. It is a brilliant, brilliant book. I highly, highly recommend reading this. Um, she does have another book coming out in, I think, January at this point. Um, but that was kind of a life changer for me. It's, it's, I say this every so often, but it's my goosebump book. It's the one that just gets me all revved up. So the book that I don't have, but I have a galley. And a galley is an advanced reading edition that we publishers do. It's a paperback edition that we give to our favorite bookstores. And uh, Liza tomorrow is going to get a copy of Unsheltered by Barbara Kingsolver. So this is coming out, I don't remember the exact date, but it's coming out in the fall. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about it, because I'm not. But you just have to go pre-order it, so she <laughs> buys a lot from me. <laughs> yeah, well, you should tell us a little bit. Yeah, a two cents. OK. <laughs> Two cents. OK, well, I don't have the book in front of me to ref refer to the characters, but it's a dual history book, um, dual narrative, rather. And one is contemporary times, and one is several hundred, uh, hundred years ago. And the contemporary narrative is of this family that has moved into this house. It's a family heirloom. Um, she is the breadwinner in the family. The husband has a university job that is in Pangwell. Their grown son has moved back home because his uh, fiance has died and left him with their baby to care for. He's a ne'er-do-well. He doesn't have a job. He's in debt coming out the wazoo. And the, the mom in this family looking at this new home says, what an opportunity. What a great home. But it's falling apart. So they need to go remodel it. And they're told, not worth it. The thing is falling down. You cannot fix this house. Um, and then it flashes back to 100 years prior when the home was built by family members in this utopian community where everybody was supposed to be getting along and doing really well, but it was really shoddy labor. And um, the unhappy story of the family involved there. It also brings in, um, and it brings in political elements as King Solver is wont to do. She's fairly liberal. Um, so I love her. Um, I love her anyway. But um, it, it kind of, I, I won't go into too much of the politics. I mean, she's not out there kind of waving um, the flag or anything. But she does kind of make commentary on our current administration and how that has affected things in that family. But it is, it's a beautiful book. I'm very excited. And now. Can I give Thank it back to her? <laughs> so you just learned if you ask a book rep to say two sentences about anything, you'll get you know two yeah. pages at least. Because right. we can't keep yeah. back our enthusiasm. Um, so I know many of you got to meet Peter Heller when he was here for the Dog Stars a few years ago. Um, this is his latest novel, Celine, 
which the, the backstory of this book is as fascinating as the book itself. Um, the main character is a woman who comes from a very well-to-do uh, family, and she's also a private detective. And she is um, tasked with finding mostly missing persons. That's, that's what her specialty is. Um, but she's tasked with finding the father of a young woman who went missing in Wyoming 20 years prior. And everybody believed that he was killed by a bear. But his daughter, Gabriella, just refuses to believe that. And so hires Celine to solve this mystery. So Celine and her new husband, Pete, sort of travel off cross country to go to Wyoming and investigate this case. It's fun. I mean, Peter Heller is an amazing writer of the outdoors. But the fascinating part, and I don't think this is anywhere in the book, so you might have to do a little Googling before your, your book club meeting. Um, but Celine, the character, is based on Peter Heller's actual mother. And she was really a very well-heeled Connecticut genteel woman who tracked down missing persons from her apartment under the Brooklyn Bridge, which also just recently went on the market and was covered in the New York Times because Peter and his siblings um, sold the apartment. And the apartment is, is described in this novel, and it sounds like it was exactly as it was in real life. Um, but this is something, you know, there's not necessarily a ton to talk about, but if you feel like having a great read and, and you know, investigating both an, an author who has written a lot of different things and, and outdoors and investigating the case along with Celine um, and drinking lots of wine while you're talking about it, you'll have a lot of fun. <laughs> I love mysteries, but they make sometimes tough um, book discussions if you're, like, determined to have an hour-long discussion about the motivations. It doesn't always work. Um, Julia Glass, you probably know from her Pulitzer Prize winning Three Junes. Um, this is her newest book, A House Among the Trees. I loved Three Junes, but this one sort of spoke to me a little bit more emotionally. Um, the main character of this book actually is a woman who, for years and years, was a caretaker to a, or, or personal assistant to a children's book illustrator. And the children's book illustrator has died at the beginning of this book. And his um, personal assistant, Tommy, is left to grapple with his estate. And there's supposed to be a film being made. But now that he's died, the filmmakers don't really know what to do. So the actor who plays this artist comes to visit Tommy to find out all about Mort's life. Mort's the illustrator. It looks at the what it's like to be an artist, what it's like to take inspiration. And Tommy has to reach out to her brother, from whom she's been estranged. And you learn that part of the estrangement is because Tommy, as a little boy, was actually the model for the character that made Mort into a millionaire. But he, de he didn't know that. And so um, all the riches and all the wealth that Mort has had, when the now young man finds out about this, he, he feels that he's actually um, entitled to a lot of this. And, and Tommy, as, as the estate caretaker, sort of has to wrangle with that. Um, the character of Mort, to me, feels a lot like Maurice Sendak. Um, what little I know about Maurice Sendak's life feels very true. I think he was probably a couple of different people who inspired this character. But I, I definitely get the sense that Sendak was one of them. But it's a, an excellent, excellent book. And um, Julia Glass, like I said, I think Three Junes um, probably will get more literary acclaim than this. But this one really touched me in the heart. All right, one of my favorite novels. So you mentioned The Rosie Project before. You know, a lot of people always ask for happy novels. They're really hard. First of all, I, I read really dark, depressing, sad stuff. That's what I love. But also, sometimes happy novels are just, like, not a lot happens if everybody's happy. You know, someone wants a book where, you know, nobody dies and nothing bad happens. And, like, there's just no story there. So I, I sort of have a, a list of, you know, my three or four go-tos when people want a book like that. The Rosie Project is, is at the top of that list. Um, and this is also now on this list, standard deviation. Now, I won't say nothing bad happens in this book, but what happens is it's, it's not treated in a way that it feels particularly tragic in, in the way that Katherine Heine writes this. Um, it's a story of uh, Graham Cavanaugh, who is on his second marriage with his wife, Audra. So you know people like this. Graham is sort of staid and buttoned down. 
really respectable guy, and Audra is just larger than life. She's the kind of person who will go to the grocery store and start a conversation and end up bringing three people that were in line behind her home for dinner. Um, she's the person that everybody calls when you need to know who the doctor is or who should you see to fix this problem. She knows everybody, she knows everything. And they have this really nice life in their New York apartment with their son. Um, who is somewhere on the autism Asperger spectrum. It's never really spelled out. But he is obsessed with origami. So the three of them have this lovely little life. And then Audra strikes up a friendship with Graham's first wife. And by friendship, I mean she invites her on vacation with them. <laughs> And things go from there. So Graham is kind of torn because he loves Audra, his second wife, and yet now that he's becoming close again with his first wife, he starts to remember what he loved about her too. And meanwhile, you have this origami-obsessed child and all the interesting people that he meets. It's just really wonderful. Um, it's funny. I laughed out loud, which I almost never do because really I like dark, depressing books. Um, so standard deviation. And then I have two nonfiction books that I think are great for book groups. Hopefully you've read one or two of these because they're both very popular. Killers of the Flower Moon, have any of you read this? This was an amazing story, I had no idea. Um, in the 1920s, the Osage Indians discovered oil on their reservation. You know, they were, they were taken off their land, put on this reservation, kind of left by the American government to make their own life, and they struck oil. They became the richest Americans of the time. Their children went to Swiss boarding schools. They flew on private planes. They, they drove fancy cars. They had limousines, everything. And then one by one, they started dying mysteriously. And certain families would lose one member, then another member. Nobody was able to put the pieces together. At this time, the federal government was creating what we know as the FBI. And this was one of the first murder cases that the FBI ever handled. Um, the local government in Oklahoma was, did not have any jurisdiction on the reservation, so they were not really able to do anything to investigate this case. So a young J. Edgar Hoover sent up a, a young man, Tom Ford, who, um, I'm sorry, Tom White, who was a former Texas Ranger, and put him in charge of investigating this case. And what he found was incredible. Um, so it's a very little known piece of history. David Graham is an incredible writer. Um, he writes nonfiction like a novelist. It's a page turner. You keep going, and it's all true. And then another one of my favorites, The Stranger in the Woods by Michael Finkel. Um, in Northwestern Maine, there are many communities of lake cottages. You know, people will have a home for the summer. It's not really meant for year round, so they close it down in the winter, go home, come back the next summer. And over the years, people would come back and they'd open their cottages and they'd find weird things missing. No valuables. You know, the computer was always there, the television was always there, but they would be missing dog food or batteries or the steak that they knew they left in the freezer that they were ready to throw out, and now it's not there. And so over 25 years, this legend popped up of the Northwoods Hermit. Oh, it must be the Northwoods Hermit, they said. And in some cases, it was flippant and kind of humorous, but some people were genuinely discomfited by this. You know, they were wondering if someone was watching them as they were sleeping. Like these, They just had this sense of unease. So the local police decided to, they were going to find out who was breaking into these camps and cottages. And so they set a trap. And one night, somebody broke in, and they got him. And it was this um, Christopher Knight who it turned out, had been living in the woods, unseen by anybody, for, I think it was 27 years. Um, in 1986, he lost his job, borrowed a, a rented van, drove it into the woods of Maine, got out, walked into the woods, and was never seen again until he was captured in, I think it was 2015, 2014 or 2015. Um, when they found him, he was still wearing the exact same glasses that he had on in 1986. He had built this incredible camp. The base was National Geographic magazines that he used kind of as the foundation. 
He only stole things that he needed to keep himself alive or entertained. He always would steal books. Um, and he claimed that he lived outside. He never slept indoors one night over 25 years in a Maine winter. And Michael Finkel investigated this and believes that, yes, it really could have been true. Um, he claims that he spoke to one person in that 25 years, and that was a hiker he passed, and he said hello, and that was the only words he spoke to another human being in that entire time. Um, so this Northwoods hermit really did exist and was a hermit. So Michael Finkel started this correspondence with Christopher Knight, and through the course of the correspondence turned into this book. Um, it leaves a lot of questions open. Uh, it's not necessarily cut and dried exactly. Um, what people believe should have happened. Half of the people think that he should have been locked up for life. Other people think he should have just been let go. Um, he did do some jail time, and the end of the book does follow him a little bit after he gets out of jail, and you see kind of what life he's trying to put together for himself. But it's just a fascinating look. You know, when I first started reading this, I thought I was going to read a true crime novel, and it ended up being a really interesting sort of psychological look at somebody. Um, there's so much to read and to, and to talk about here, and it's fantastic. So that is The Stranger in the Woods. Thank you.